Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off with a brief intro so we can really jump into it right away as people are still signing in. Um, thank you all very, very, very much for being here this morning, um, afternoon, or evening, as the case may be, for geoeconomics and the balance of payments. My name is Jack Gross. I'm the editor of Phenomenal World, which is a web publication run out of the Jane Family Institute and applied. research organization in New York City that works across several areas, including deed income, higher education, finance, and digital ethics and governance. We're extremely thrilled to have you all here for this event, um, which was initiated by Adam Tooze after several weeks of Twitter debates, which I noticed were still raging last night as I shut my computer um, and has been variously called a murderer's row, the commissariat of economic analysis, the Coachella of political economy, and quote, a terrible idea. Um, but what I think is really exciting here is the opportunity to continue hashing out these questions, which Adam will outline in a moment as we get started in a new setting and to introduce some historical and contextual reference that can help those of us on the sidelines both read the contours of these differing positions and the stakes of these debates. Um, to do this, we have a truly incredible lineup who I'll introduce after a very brief bit of housekeeping. Um, we have over a thousand people on the line here and more coming in on YouTube. Um, the discussion will proceed as soon as I stop talking for about two hours until noon Eastern time. I know a couple of people have a hard stop. We'll likely run a little bit over though. Um, and given the depth and breadth of the material that we hope to cover, we won't be doing a formal question period, but I will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A feature throughout, um, as well as the comments on YouTube. And I'll chime in to ventriloquize audience comments and questions where it seems fitting. So please feel free to type questions into the chat, but there are a lot of you and a lot of panelists. So forgive the less than totally interactive format. If you need to jump off early, a recording will be saved on YouTube. And if you sign up for the JFI weekly newsletter, which rounds up interesting papers across the social sciences, we'll share it out there on Saturday morning. Okay, onward. So we are uh, incredibly lucky to have with us this morning in alphabetical order, Mona Ali, Associate Professor of Economics at SUNY New Paltz, Daniela Gabor, Professor of Economics and Macro Finance at UWE Bristol, Isabella Kaminska, Editor of FT Alphaville, Matt Klein, Reporter at Barron's and Co-Author of Trade Wars or Class Wars, J.W. Mason, Assistant Professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, Michael Pettis, Professor oh, of Finance at, at Peking University and co-author of Trade Wars or Class Wars. Brad Setzer, Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. John Sindrew, Financial Markets and Global Transportation Reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Colby Smith, Markets Reporter for the Financial Times. Nathan Tankus, Research Director at the Modern Money Network and Publisher of Notes on the Crises. And finally, Adam Tews, professor of history at Columbia University, who is moderating and to whom I will now pass things over. Thank you all again very, very much for taking the time to be here today. Well, thank, thank you, Jack. It's, it's really great to be back and great thank you to you and your organization for hosting us. I say back because the, the idea for this session was spawned really by the fantastic conversation that uh, Matt Klein and Michael Pettis and I had about their book, um, uh, Why Trade Wars or Class Wars, that came out, uh, that debate we, we had in May. And, and uh, if you haven't seen it, I, I strongly recommend going back to the video on the Giant, on the Giant Family website. Uh, at the time, I felt there was more that we, we needed to discuss. And, and as the Twitter debate has exploded over the last couple of weeks, it, that, that, that desire on my part became more and more intense despite the obvious problems with, with making a conversation like this work. And so I just want to add my thanks to Jax that thank you all for being game and we're gonna see how this works. Um, but I would love it if we could really make this as far as possible, a kind of open book workshop type event. Let's try and think uh, interactively with each other in this setting and do our best to make the best of a bad situation. But I do think we should say a big thank you to, to Zoom in enabling this extraordinary convocation at relatively short notice at quite a low cost and making it available to such an extraordinary range of people in the audience as well. I think that um, Matt and Michael's book serves brilliantly as an anchor for a conversation like this because it's such a 
excellent effort at synthesis of a certain strand in the debate that's been going on about the international political economy for really the last generation. And it's, it's worth noting that we, we have a very interesting generational combination here of folks uh, of my generation, of Michael's generation, of grads who have been thinking about international political economy since the 80s and 90s, and then successive ways of other contributors um, becoming at different stages. One of the participants, I, I won't name names, remarked that the only thing that you need to know about his biography is that he enrolled in high school on the 10th of September 2001 and graduated college in May 2009. So a very, very pronounced, as it were, uh, uh, experience of crisis, which has preoccupied all of us. And the distinctive lens which Michael and Matt bring to bear on this is, is what I think you might describe as a kind of modified and very interestingly modified uh, Keynesianism, uh, an account of uh, macroeconomic balance, imbalance, which doesn't start by thinking about macroeconomic imbalances as the result of competitiveness difference, but starts from aggregate demand, from the balance of savings and investment. Um, a distinctive line of interpretation, which of course centered around and acquired its canonical formulation in Ben Bernanke's piece on the savings glut in 2005, has a variety of different political shadings. It can be taken after all in the austerian twin deficits direction. It can be taken out to a series of questions about American global economic power and the standing of the dollar. But the distinctive way in which they twist it, which I think is fascinating, very productive and rich, is in towards uh, Hobson and the, the analysis of social inequality and its impact on macroeconomic imbalances. You might say and very much of, of the moment post Piketty and our struggle, many of us have been involved in this, thinking of Mona and Brad's work in particular, and trying to think through the relationships between inequality and macroeconomics and international macroeconomics. But it's not just the magnificent synthesis, and I think actually also a remarkably effectively succinct piece of modern history, contemporary history writing about the meaning of 1989 in macroeconomic terms. It also poses really fundamental analytical questions, and it's really those which I hoped this panel would really be able to dig into. Because the question that's really posed is whether this framework will really suffice to do the work that we need for thinking about modern capitalism. Um, can the notion of excess saving and the movement of funds across the capital account do the work that, that Klein and Pettis uh, want it to do? And I think it was that question that really jogged the debate into action on Twitter in recent weeks, because Nathan Tankers took up the toolkit of what I take to be a kind of money view or an MMT inspired accounting to pose the question of whether or not movements on capital account really could do that work. He got support from Josh Mason, who I think is coming from what you might describe as a sort of monetary Keynesian, left Keynesian perspective. And major fault lines began to open up, I thought, of an intellectual variety within the camp of Keynesianism, which of course acts on our interpretation of various aspects of Keynes's theory, and above all, of course, the role of money and liquidity in Keynes's thought. You could say, pose it to, to, to compress it into a nugget, is the question the problem of excess savings, a savings glut, or as Jörg Bibo, the German Keynesian formulated it already in 2008, is the problem that really of a dollar glut. The debate didn't stop there. Tankers's critique summoned up a vigorous and empirically rich response from Brad Setzer, who I'm delighted to have on the call, of course, a veteran of the treasury uh, in policy circles in the moment of the crisis from 2008 onwards. And as you will know, a brilliant analyst of the balance of payments situation of the world. And as the debate spiraled, it drew in interventions from John Sandreo and Daniela Garbo, who I think take positions which are distinct from both those of Klein and Pettis on the one hand and Tankers on the other. They're ill at ease, I think both John and Daniela with the savings glut view, because I think it seems a little bit too close for comfort to a kind of lump of savings position. But on the other hand, um, as you would expect from a leading figure in the world of critical macro finance, such as Daniela, also somewhat ill at ease with the rather passive role accorded to bank balance sheets, in the, at least in the, in the blog post that we had from, from, from um, I think the question that they're asking uh, in a sense, is, is the problem, and it's the question that was first formulated in this form by uh, Hing Chin Shin in a uh, famous paper of 2011, is the problem a savings glut, is the problem a dollar glut, is the problem a problem of banking glut. And if it's a problem of banking glut, whose banks are the banks that we carry um, in the Eurozone story in particular, which is one which has shaped very much the thinking of Daniela and John and myself. 
If we thus map the dollar and the euro system between those two poles in the debate, uh, Mona Ali makes the invaluable contribution of thinking about the other great axis of global finance, which is the one, the classic one, if you like, of the 19th and 20th century, which runs between the UK and the United States and has done fundamental work probing the guts, the underpinnings, but also the fragilities of the US and UK balance of payments, particularly the UK balance of payments in the moment after Brexit. Meanwhile, Colby Smith throughout this year has been doing sterling and uh, essential work mapping the convulsions of the dollar-based financial system in this latest shock. If you haven't already, you must read her, pay, her, her, her essay, her long read on the March 2020 shock. Um, and Isabella Kaminska's Alphaville has been, as ever, really one of the great fora for debate about global finance, as it has been ever since she joined that blog in 2008. Both specific issues like how are the swap lines functioning this time, but also the most fundamental, if you like, deep question, which is what is money at all and what role does money play and how does it continue to evolve in an age of digital currency? So questions abound here. We have an extraordinary bounty of expertise on the panel. We have the question of how you think excess savings actually work in international macro, how the balance of payments flows affect the current account, how active, elastic, dynamic, causal do we think that the credit system is? How do we imagine credit systems globally, not just nationally? How do we account for the relationship between, on the one hand, stories which are about structural change and trade on the one hand and stories which are about financial crisis on the other? Are they the same kind of stories? Are they the same kind of analytic? How do problems of inequality and social and economic transformation relate to macrofinancial dynamics? The question insistently posed by Matt and Michael. How solid is the, is the position of the United States? Is it fateful, inscribed, inescapable, or in fact quite fragile? Is that what we saw in March, how fragile it might have been? How unique is the logic of the American system? How unique is the Sino-American axis? Is it really helpful to think in terms of analogies to the German case? Is the Spanish German axis, for instance, analogous to the Chinese American axis under the sign of a certain sort of macroeconomic analysis? Do these uh, questions generalize to Europe? A huge range of possible questions that we might be addressing as a way in, what I thought I would do is to ask Michael and Matt to lay out the position that we start from, and in particular for Michael to give us um, his take on the issue of capital controls, because it was really his paper, his short paper for the Carnegie uh, 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 on the issue of the possibility of a tax, if you like, a tariff on capital movement as opposed to a quota. Um, um, that set this ball rolling, and then perhaps for Matt to stand back and give us, as it were, the broader context of that specific proposal in the context of their wider argument, and then we will bring in, as it were, phase by phase, uh, the debate that followed. So welcome all, thank you all for being here, and um, if, uh, if Michael is there, uh, technology permitting, um, Michael, will you, will, you, will you take us away? Uh, great, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, what I want to do is sort of set out the uh, the frame. What I want to do is set out the framework that um, that that we use within the book, and come to the conclusion or arrive at the conclusion of why it is that some form of capital controls we believe is necessary. And to start off with, I I, I know there's a, a couple of papers that probably everyone has read by Atif Mian, Ludwig Straub, and Amir Sufi, which I think. Are, are very important in sort of the direction that we're trying to go. The, the first point that, that, that I would make is um, we use the phrase savings glut a lot. I'm not totally comfortable with the phrase. And in the book, we, don't, we refer to it only in passing. I don't know if it's a savings glut or a dearth of investment. And, and, and logically, those two things are more or less the same thing. But the point that we try to make is that the, uh, uh, the balance of payments imbalances are mainly a function in the modern world, this wasn't necessarily true 150 years ago, but are mainly a function of uh, distortions in the distribution of income. And by that we mean uh, high savings countries are not high savings countries because they have a cultural propensity to save. They're high savings countries because of the way income is distributed. So, if you transfer income from uh, 
the high consuming part of society, which is basically ordinary households and workers, towards either the wealthy or businesses or governments, then automatically, because you are transferring income from high consuming groups to high savings groups, automatically the ex ante national savings rate goes up. And I say ex ante because it's not clear that savings go up. In a closed system, the only way savings can go up is if um, desired investment levels are much higher than actual levels so that those savings can be channeled into investment. And in our book, we argue that in uh, most advanced economies, that's no longer true. Um, uh, businesses don't fail to invest because the cost of capital is extremely high and because there is a scarcity of savings. There are other reasons that they fail to invest. So when you increase the availability of savings, it's not as if they're going to increase their investment levels. So if investment doesn't go up, something else must happen. And what's the something else? Um, well, one thing that could happen <clears throat> is because of the transfer of income from uh, consumers to non-consumers, total demand could decline. And with the decline in total demand, uh, manufacturers may lay off workers. And of course, a laid off worker has a negative savings rate. So you get an adjustment that way. The increase in savings among the rich or among businesses, or in the case of China in the government, is matched by a reduction of savings in the household sector. Uh, but there are other things that could happen too. So for example, in order to forestall a rise in unemployment, uh, the government could increase uh, deficit spending, uh, um, uh, which is negative savings. So that'll reduce the savings rate that way or it could encourage um, through the central bank an increase in household debt. So households borrow money in order to maintain their level of consumption. And of course that borrowing reduces the savings rate. The point is that in a closed system, an increase in ex ante savings doesn't necessarily result in an increase in savings. It could result in an increase in debt or in a reduction in, uh, in, in total income. And that's why I'm uncomfortable with the, the phrase savings glut, because it sounds like there is a net increase in savings, and we argue that there isn't. Uh, what ends up happening is that the change in savings in one part of the economy must be matched with a uh, equal and opposite change in savings in, in another part of the economy. Now, that's in a closed system. Um, for a member, an open member within that closed system, there is another possibility, and that is to export both the excess savings and the export production to another country. And what we argue is, in fact, that that's what tends to happen. So imagine we have a, a world of two countries, uh, Germany and the United States. Germany implements policies that basically transfer, uh, for example, uh, income from workers to businesses, business profits go up, the workers' share of, uh, of, of GDP goes down, that automatically forces up the savings rate. If Germany is unable to use those additional <clears throat> savings in the form of higher investment, then it exports those, sa those savings. And where does it export the savings to? Well, uh, for a bunch of reasons, and we can go in why, but I assume most of us understand them, for a bunch of reasons, those savings are likely to be exported to countries like the United States, to a lesser extent, uh, the UK or other so-called Anglo-Saxon economies with well-functioning and well-governed financial markets. Now, that doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem systemically. It solves the demand deficiency within Germany, but basically by transferring it to the United States or to whichever country um, the savings uh, uh, are exported. Now, there's a big confusion here because I often hear people saying things like the fact that, uh, that uh, 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 Germany buys American assets, invests money in the US doesn't mean that an American has to buy a German car. And no, of course not, because what really matters is that at the national level, the imbalances balance. It doesn't really have to happen at the individual level on trade. So for example, if we introduce more than two countries, let's say there are three countries, Brazil, Germany, and the United States, if they're all in balance and 
Germany implements policies that transfer income from workers to the business sector, and that causes the German savings rate to go up, and Germany exports those $100 of savings to the United States. We don't know anything about the trade pattern. All we know is that Germany must run a $100 surplus and the US must run a $100 deficit. And it doesn't have to be with each other. Um, Germany could run a surplus with Brazil and Brazil run a surplus with the US. Germany could run a surplus with the US. It doesn't really matter. The point is that at the systemic level, it must balance. And so we argue, A, and I think probably there won't be too much uh, controversy within this group, we argue that an attempt to resolve the imbalances by putting tariffs on, on, on traded goods is really not going to work. Um, if, uh, if, for example, in the current case uh, with the Trump administration putting uh, taxes on, on uh, uh, Chinese imports into the US, the only thing they will do if China is exporting $100 of savings to the US, if you put tariffs on Chinese imports, that will reduce the U.S. deficit with China, but it won't affect the overall U.S. deficit and it won't affect the overall China uh, surplus. It will simply switch them around, uh, which is basically a long way of saying that the bilateral trade imbalances don't really matter. We would argue that it's the capital flow imbalances that really determine the trade imbalances. Um, so. What's the, uh, what would be the right uh, uh, approach to resolve that? So if you're, in the U if you're the US or to a lesser extent, the UK, Canada, Australia, you're in a position where excess savings and excess production in other countries, and let me pause here and say countries that run trade surpluses do not run surpluses because they're more efficient at producing uh, manufactured goods. Um, if there is such a thing as a hardworking, more efficient country, its reward is not a trade surplus. Its reward is increasing amounts of imports per, per unit of production. Um, when countries run trade surpluses, persistent trade surpluses, uh, year after year, decade after decade, it has to do with the, um, with the distribution of income domestically. So basically, um, you look at say England versus Germany, the average German is about 115% as productive as the average English worker, and yet they get paid roughly the same. So the problem isn't absolute levels of wages, it's the level of wages relative to, uh, to income. So what we argue is that countries that compete on competitiveness do so generally by lowering wages, either directly or they can do it indirectly by undermining the social safety net, by depreciating the currency, uh, by environmental degradation. There's a lot of ways of doing it. But the point is that those surpluses of both produced goods and of excess savings are generated by distortions in the way income is, uh, is uh, dis uh, uh, distributed domestically. In a closed system, they would not be able to do that. They would have to resolve their demand efficiencies domestically, typically by increasing investment or, or by increasing wages. But in an open system, they don't have to do that. They have an alternative, which is to transfer those savings to say the United States, which then has to resolve that domestic demand efficiency either by a rise in unemployment, assuming that the US, is not, US investment is not savings constrained, either by a rise in unemployment or more likely by a rise either in household debt or in the fiscal deficit. So if you're, if you're the US, your role in this international system is pretty much to absorb, and typically it's 40 to 50% of global surpluses in savings or in production. Um, and that, we argue, forces the U.S. Uh, to, to choose really between uh, a, a rising unemployment or rising household or fiscal uh, debt. And if the U.S. wants to prevent that from happening, then what we argue is there's a number of ways we can do that. The, the, the high road, which we discuss in our book, is a new Bretton Woods agreement in which we perhaps dust off Keynes' original proposal, 
which puts constraints both on the use of the dollar because under Keynes's proposal, the dollar wasn't the reserve currency. There was a, a, a constraint on the reserve currency through Bancor. And in addition, both surplus and deficit countries have to pay for the adjustment process. So maybe that's the way you do it. But I am uh, frankly very pessimistic uh, uh, about our ability to do that. So I would argue that the alternative is that countries like the U.S. unilaterally take steps to prevent themselves from being forced to absorb global imbalances. And Michael, how do you do could, that? Could I, well, at that point, yeah. could I at that point suggest that maybe Matt takes up the story at that point um, to elaborate on the proposals for the U.S. Okay. just in the interest of time and, and ensuring that we the conversation flows? Matt, do you want to take up the story on the on the options okay. for the, for, is, that, is that okay? Sure. Cool. So first of all, I agree with saving luck can be a confusing terminology. And in fact, I searched our PDF of the book last night and we used it precisely once. And it was specifically in the context of you know, how can we have a saving glut when the global savings rate hasn't changed? Uh, and then going on and explaining sort of how, you know, savings rates rising in individual countries, crowd, you know, cause seems to be correlated or offset by savings rate fall in other countries. So uh, I, I share, I think, many people believing that saving glut is a con confusing term. The question is, if you have, you know, the problems that Michael and I describe, which is essentially that there is this sort of persistent mismatch globally between you know, the productive capacity of the world economy and you know, actual demand for goods and services or you know, be more precise, the actual spending on goods and services. People demand a lot of things, but their actual you know, consumption of these things. You know, how is that going to get resolved? And you know, globally, there's two options, essentially. That you can either you know, end up producing less or you have uh, you know, consumption rise to meet it. And if incomes, you know, people's money income for the people who would, you know, spend to buy those things, you know, isn't sufficient, then it has to come through debt, which is what we've seen. And there's plenty of people who've, who've done a lot of detailed research on this. You can look at, um, there's a great paper by uh, Michael Kumhoff and uh, Pablo Winant and Roman Ranciere that came out a few years ago, essentially saying, you know, in the 1920s, you had this issue in the United States of massive increase in inequality. United States was a trade surplus country back then, by the way, and yet, nevertheless, uh, that increase in inequality was resolved with a massive increase in household debt within the United States. We know how that ended. Then they compared that to what happened in the 2000s of the U.S. You can see this is in many other countries as well. You know, Michael mentioned uh, the work of Atif Mian and, and Amir Sufi, and they've, they've found this as well. So that's sort of the sort of global situation. Our little gloss here is that in the international situation, if you divide up the world, you know, into countries, the increases in debt and the you know deficiencies of production and so forth don't have to line up perfectly, and so you can have situations where some countries are effectively the ones taking on the debt and you know essentially doing their you know absorbing the you know excess production, if you will, and then other countries are you know producing more and not consuming, and that's you know really what we're looking at. And so then the question is, you know, what's the ideal solution? And the ideal solution is, you know, people should spend more, right? Collectively, if we have productive capacity to um, you know, satisfy more material needs than we are, we should be taking advantage of that. They were essentially leaving money on the table by not doing that as, you know, a species. And, you know, that would be, and that's why we spend a lot of the book talking about, you know, the specific dynamics in countries that, um, including the U.S., where demand is relatively lower than it should be and what things can be done practically to resolve that. And some of that, and a lot of that involves changes in the distribution of income and, and specific issues in specific societies. So we focus a lot on, on Europe and China, but you can apply this other places as well. Failing that, then the question is, you know, what should be done? And, you know, the, the appeal of sort of financial inflow controls or what, you know, the IMF calls capital flow management measures is that it helps remove some of the costs for, you know, a particular society for the choices of other societies. You can think of this as sort of like pollution, right? I know, uh, Adam, you're doing, you know, a lot of work now on the, the challenges of the Anthropocene and, you know, to sort of basically summarize, if you have a lot of coal production in the U.S. and then, you know, Suriname goes underwater, that's sort of, you know, <laughs> you can have a financial analogy to this, this basic mm -hmm. situation where something that is totally unrelated to what you're doing uh, can of nevertheless affect conditions in your country. And so it's strange, you know, Americans have a hard time wrapping their heads around this because we're used to thinking that the whole world revolves around us, but 
you know, even though we are the largest single economy in the world, it's, it, you know, that still applies in varying degrees. And, and it's not surprising that emerging market countries are the, really the ones who pioneered the idea of, of, you know, this way of thinking and, and capital flow management measures. But the basic idea is that if the changes in um, foreign, you know, investor preferences or foreign saver preferences, whatever you want to call it, can affect your local uh, financial conditions. And that can then flow through to sort of real economy effects. And so how would you prevent that? And there are a lot of different ways of doing this. The particular proposal uh, in the US that that Michael wrote about that sparked this whole discussion um, was basically saying, um, have the Federal Reserve intervene in the foreign exchange markets to uh, you know, target a level of the dollar such that the current account balances over time and to limit how much you know, the Federal Reserve might actually have to accumulate in foreign assets because there are a lot of practical limitations for this. Like, what would you actually buy in the real world to do this? You would also supplement that um, or anchor that with essentially a, a charge so that anyone outside the United States wanting to buy a U.S. asset would have to pay some tax. And the idea being that you would discourage to a degree um, some purchases by lowering sort of the prospective returns. Now, you know, how well would this work in practice? I don't know. I mean, there are other countries that do things like this. You know, Chile has, you know, for many years had a, a rule where essentially if you buy um, a Chilean asset and you're not Chilean, you have to deposit a certain amount essentially in advance the central bank and, you know, the limits on, you know, when you can take it out. And that seems to have, you know, biased foreign investment in favor of things like FDI, which is more stable and less likely to create problems as opposed to sort of hot money debt flows. So, you know, you can see, you know, you know, Daniela's here and she can talk a lot about, you know, the Eastern European experience. In fact, that's sort of my introduction to finance was, was looking at this, you know, from sort of the investment angle and right. If you're, you're in the situation of say Hungary and, you know, the domestic central bank is trying to tighten financial conditions and yet, you know, people inside the country are just saying, well, we'll borrow in Swiss francs because interest rates, you know, there's like a six percentage point spread, you know, you have to have some other kind of tool to prevent that. And, you know, how that manifests in different countries can be very different. Obviously, in the United States, you don't have people taking out Swiss franc mortgages, but uh, you know you can see that. You know, I, I think it is not a coincidence, and maybe you know this is where it's going to disagree. You know, people are going to come to, but I don't think it's a coincidence that we we saw systematic changes in you know lending standards and and the way that um, investors and and loan originators in the United States behaved in the two thousands. During which also happened to be a period where we saw massive non-economic inflows into U.S. financial assets. And non-economic, in other words, you know, foreign reserve managers were not buying this stuff because they were looking to make a high return. They were really trying to, you know, purchase hedges at, you know, whatever price. Um, after the age, experience of the Asian financial crisis, and I think, you know, from their perspective, we can understand why they might have done that. But you know, you can also see how that really had an impact in the United States. And I think we can, you know, if we want to go down the line. There are lots of other examples. One of the ones we you know, point to in the book, which I think is quite interesting, is the experience of uh, the German Empire immediately after unification in 1871, where Matt, you know, can we maybe come to the sure. wider, the wider ramifying circle of, of experience here, and and give and give um, the critics, if I may call them that, the chance to 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 put their skepticism about this story. It's you know, it's it's rooted in a Keynesian uh, macro that many, all of us are familiar with. Um, it does indeed have, you know, the support of a variety of different historic experiences. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there was a profound skepticism voiced online. And that really, for me, the, the most important thing we can do in this session is to try and get to the source of that uncertainty, right? Because I find your story, I find Michael's story, it's, you know, it's, it's incredibly intuitive to me at one level. And I want to understand better the skepticism uh, of the other side. So maybe Nathan, would you would you would you be willing to take up take up the argument? John was sure. also very much of this side. Josh was very much in on this line. So if you can destabilize, if you like, the the familiar narrative that we've heard, that would be great. I, I joked on Twitter that I'm authorized to say half a sentence. So <laughs> glad I got uh, one <laughs> sentence in uh, there. Um, so I, I want to you know just as as kind of setting the field for a second um you know i'm gonna fo i'm gonna focus maybe a little myopically on what i wrote about um and i want to be explicit in terms of i wrote about uh michael michael's uh proposal um that was published at the carnegie foundation about tax and capital flows i have not gotten a chance to read uh uh trade wars or class wars so m from my point of view it's up to other people who, who, yes. who have, you, and you have, yeah, 
um, to, to decide whether my, cri my critique applies to the book. Um, I'm just purely focused on, on my my originally premium post that I unlocked and set all this off uh, unexpectedly um, was purely focused on that. Um, and so for me, when reading Michael's proposal, um, my you know my my concern revolved around <laughs> around precisely the balance of payment, trying to nail down exactly what the balance of payments dynamic that. Um, Pettis was proposing. You know, he 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 says in, in that proposal, and I th I thought in the post that that was like a, really a core um, vision um, that went into it is that the purpose of the tax would be to reduce capital flows until they are largely in balance with outflows. A country's capital account and current account must always match up exactly. So a balanced U.S. capital account would mean a balanced current account, and with this, the U.S. trade deficit would disappear. And so when, when I read, you know, that and I read, you know, read the proposal in its entirety, um, the vision I got was that there were these capital flows that were flowing into the U.S. And simply by the, the definition of these capital flows flowing to the U.S. were causing uh, trade deficits and were causing current account deficits for the United States. And from my point of view, and which I laid on the post and there's been debates and arguments about it, um, that that just sort of me mechanical identity-based argument um, didn't really seem to hold up to me because, you know, we, we talk, we, you know, we, we talk in very metaphorical terms about capital flows and about cross-border financial flows, but um, except when you're uh, making interest payments or making dividend payments, um, which are one-sided transactions where someone is simply receiving payment and there's no other offsetting transaction, uh, financing transactions tend to be two-way. You're, you're either you're directly making a cross-border bank loan, in which case you're, uh, um, you know, the, they're getting a financial asset, but the, the you are also receiving, uh, the lender is also receiving an IOU, or there's uh, an exchange, there's an exchange rate transaction where um, dollars or where, where dollar deposits uh, in the United States are sold for, say, euro deposits uh, uh, in a foreign country that in that, um, because since there was two-way transactions, you need a further causal mechanism um, for those uh, capital account transactions, for those cross-border financial flows to translate into uh, in, into uh, trade deficits, current account transactions, and 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 to be and to be clear, um, and because I think this was a lot of where the Twitter confusion hinged, that argument doesn't rely on. For, uh, foreign entities um, not being able to change financial conditions uh, in another country. Like, you know, you, if, if you're making a cross-border loan, you're potentially changing the, the overall financial conditions in the United States. Um, and it being a two-way offsetting transaction doesn't change the ability to, for, uh, to change financial conditions. Um, and um, nor is it an argument that all sort of capital uh, current account capital flows cross border financial transactions get accommodated such that you know essentially exchange rates never move. Um, you know, absolutely, cross border financial flows, even though they're two way transactions, can then affect the exchange rate um, can, or can potentially affect the exchange rate. But I didn't really feel like I needed to deal with that point precisely because Pettis says specifically that his proposal doesn't rely on changing the exchange rates or even I mean, as far as I understand, maybe I misread uh, asset prices. It, it's specifically focusing on cutting off the quantity of flows. Um, and to me, that just doesn't work to uh, reduce or eliminate the United States uh, trade deficit unless, you know, cross-border uh, current account transactions are no longer being financed and no longer happening. But of course, if that happens, then we're talking about a dramatic reduction in demand from the United States to the rest of the world. Um, that's you know, fundamentally we're talking about if we're talking about financial conditions changing and mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the trade uh, the trade deficit adjusting. And um, nothing 
that I read in Pettis' proposal were based on reducing demand uh, from the United States for the rest of the world, or what would be the implications of reducing demand. And, you know, that's, this gets into work from many people, including um, Professor Mason, that precisely is dealing with the question of, uh, of you know, the role that U.S. Uh, spending in the, in the rest of the world, U.S. trade deficits uh, have in supplying uh, dollars to the rest of the world. Um, Thank you. That's 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 incredibly succinct, effective statement of what I took to exactly to be your reading. Do, Josh, do you want to come in and and amplify this critique? You you your first paper that I could find on the on the savings glut thesis is twenty fourteen, maybe or maybe maybe it was an earlier phase of this. But I know you've been wrestling with this problem from a left Keynesian position for a long time. Um, what 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 doesn't work for you about this story? Well, there, there are a couple of distinct issues here. So I think it's it's useful to separate them out. Um, one is whether the sort of accounting framework that, that Michael and Matthew, I think, have started from is a useful one for understanding trade flows. In other words, does the, do the accounting relationships that the current account and the financial account must always be equal? And the accounting relationship that the current account balance must equal the difference between domestic investment and saving. Do those in any way constrain the behavior of trade flows? Do those accounting relationships give us additional information about trade flows beyond the things that we already know influence trade flows, like relative prices and relative income growth? And the position I'm taking, and I believe the position Nathan would take and the position John would take, is no. Those accounting relationships, although they hold, don't give us any additional basis for saying anything about trade flows. Um, that, that any pattern of trade flows is going to be consistent with those relationships simply because they are accounting relationships. So on the financial side, the, in the first instance, any financial transaction creates in the form of a transfer of a bank deposit an offsetting financial transaction. That may well down the road through various behavioral adjustments cause a, trade, a change in the trade balance, but you have to actually specify the mechanisms. The only way a financial transaction is actually going to change the trade balance is if it changes the exchange rate, if it changes relative income growth, or if it changes, you know, something else that we can actually causally relate to the trade balance. You can't skip that causal step because of the accounting relationship. So I think that's, that's and the same goes with savings and investment. And I think I do want to be clear about this. The position Michael's laying out is not a variant of a Keynesian position, it's an anti-Keynesian position. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but we should be clear that sort of a central element of the Keynesian analysis is that savings is a purely passive residual accounting term. It doesn't do anything. So in a Keynesian framework, you wouldn't say, you know, if people save more and they can't use that savings domestically, maybe that savings will flow abroad. If the savings can't be used, the savings doesn't occur. First, you figure out what consumption is going to be. You figure out what investment is going to be. You figure out what the trade balance is going to be based on the actual behavioral causal factors that influence those things. And then savings is just left as a residual. So I think from a Keynesian standpoint, we're just going to reject any story that uses savings as a, as a causal term. It might be that consuming less in one country will influence that country's trade balance. It probably will, but it will do so by influencing incomes in that country or the interest rate in that country or some other variable that actually plays a causal role. And it will be the reduction in consumption that does that, not this abstract savings, which is just an after the fact residual accounting term. So that's, that's on, on the first question. I think we really reject strongly, those of us on sort of the critic side, the notion that you can use the accounting to sort of bypass or short circuit um, an actual causal story. Um, then, but then there's a second question, which is that in practice, do financial flows have a big effect on trade flows? Is this an important factor determining the pattern of trade in the world? And that's a separate question because you could agree that there's no necessary accounting-based relationship, but you might feel that in practice, there is a quite important causal relationship. You might believe that most trade flows are driven by exchange rates and exchange rates are mostly moved around by uh, cross-border portfolio flows. And so actually that's the central story about international trade. I don't believe that. But unlike the accounting-based story, I wouldn't say that story is simply wrong as a matter of logic. That's something that could be true. As it happens, I personally don't think it is true, but it could be true. Um, you know, my view, but, but the key thing here, let me, let me stress the key point here. Insofar as savings behavior, let's say, consumption behavior, macroeconomic imbalances of any kind, income distribution, insofar, even capital flows, financial flows, insofar as they affect trade balances, it is only via macroeconomic variables that affect trade flows, meaning relative prices and relative income growth rates. So if you want to influence, for instance, the US trade balance 
you know, using macroeconomic tools, either you're going to be trying to lower relative prices in the United States, or you're going to be trying to slow income growth in the United States. The only way doing anything to the financial flows is going to affect the trade balance is it affects one of those two variables along the way. And once you recognize that, then targeting the financial balance is just a really roundabout and indirect way of doing what you want to do. If you think the dollar is overvalued, you need policies to lower the value of the dollar. Taxing financial inflows might do that, but it's certainly not the most effective or direct way to do it. If you think rapid credit and income growth in the United States is driving a trade deficit and that's bad, we have lots of tools to moderate credit uh, growth in the United States that don't, don't depend on the financial account. So it's a roundabout and indirect way at best. Now, I think for other countries, the case may be different because the real reason, and there's another sort of question here, which is like, are capital controls good or bad? And I think actually probably all of us on this call agree capital controls are often good. But it's not because there's a direct mechanical relationship between capital flows and trade flows. It's because many countries in the world need capital controls to open up enough policy space to basically do anything as far as macroeconomic policy goes. So that's, that's a very strong reason for most countries in the world to adopt capital controls. It's not a reason for the United States to adopt capital controls. The United States has all the policy space it needs. So for the US, I just think this, this whole thing is kind of a, a, a non-issue. I think that for people coming from Hungary or Argentina or elsewhere, that's, that's very, they, there's very strong reasons. But even there, it's to create policy space to set the interest rate in accordance with domestic needs, to control credit growth, to have an effective anti-inflation policy, whatever it is. It's not just because limiting financial inflows is going to sort of mechanically directly improve your trade balance. Thank you. And Thank then, you, Josh. Okay. That, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I, I know that Matt and Michael by rights should have an immediate right of reply and they must be itching to do so. I would just implore you to be patient so that we can bring more voices into the room. I imagine you'll probably want to agree with a lot of the criticisms that are being made and just simply say that's what we meant to say. Uh, and we may want to argue till kingdom come about what an authentically Keynesian position is. But my priority right now is to take advantage of this incredible panel we've got. Daniela in particular, I would love to hear because John was invoked by Josh as kind of part of their camp. So I'm gonna summon Daniela, maybe Mona, if you if you want to, to tee up your, your intervention in this, that would be great. But Daniela, um, the floor is yours for a minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I feel like in a heterodox economics uh, seminar where we debate what we debated what Keynes really meant, and it feels great because in some ways it feels like we're taking over uh, the world. Uh, I want to be a bit contrarian. I, I'm trying to, I will disagree with both camps, uh, and I will be fully contrarian by showing you slides, which is quite uh, an unusual in many ways. You promised, uh, I'm delighted. Thank I, you. I did, I did promise, yeah. although I'm going to let you down on a bit uh, of the promise. <laughs> Uh, I want to say that I think in the Twitter debate, at least, we've been fighting uh, two straw men. Uh, we've been attacking two straw men. I want to clarify why I think we've, uh, which are these two straw men. And some of, it, some of them have already been sort of raised and, and, and uh, shot at uh, uh, for the last half hour. Um, oh, let's see. The first yes. straw man, yes, is that to solve capital uh, current account deficits, all you need to do is to fix the financial side via capital controls. And I think there is empirical evidence that you have countries with structural trade deficits and no capital inflows. So the story is far more complicated than that. Of course, I would argue financial flows uh, or capital account surpluses don't mechanically map onto uh, current account deficits. Uh, if we want to think more carefully through the mechanism, it's an exchange rate mechanism. But even so, there are other institutional factors at play that one needs to take into account if one wants to solve current account uh, deficits, and they have to do with the role of industrial policy, with the institutional capacity of the state to do so. They have to do with how global trade looks now, mainly organized through global value chains. I don't want to go into it, but it's a far more complex story than the one that we, I think, sort of uh, reduced it to on, on Twitter and in some of the discussions uh, here. I think also one needs to take into account that there can be a reverse causality, that is that structural current account deficits that come from structural trade imbalances can also generate, because they can generate balance of payment crisis, uh, a la Argentina or a Latin American countries, there are incentives for local policymakers to generate current account surpluses uh, by providing foreign investors with, ta with uh, uh, attractive types of assets and the uh, Euro Eastern European exp experience is quite um, sort of um, insightful in that respect uh, uh, through sterilization instruments that most central banks uh, provided up to 2008. So this Stroman I would like us to put aside in order to move further with the conversation 
The second straw man is far more interesting and I think far more debatable. And I think we've heard it somehow today a little bit, and that is capital controls don't work because uh, it's not uh, the quantity of, of assets that is demanded or US assets or other local currency assets outside the US that matters, but it's expectations. And uh, this I'm taking aim in some ways at John, but uh, I, from our discussion this morning, this may or may not be true that he said. So, but I would call this the financial globalization neutrality thesis. And in some ways, it very much uh, echoes this kind of conversations that central banks who do inflation targeting have, which says basically that the price of local financial assets is determined by the central bank in uh, combination with uh, private financial markets or private financial uh, agents through an expectations channel. And I also think it's something that uh, uh, Nathan uh, Tankas or Nathan in, in his post did in the logic of every capital inflow is it's matched by an, an outflow. It sort of rings the same uh, uh, towards the same financial globalization neutrality thesis. And I think this is wrong for a variety of reasons. First, because I'm uh, a close follower of Minsky. And I think when we want to think about what happened over the last 30 years, we have to start from uh, global finance and we have to start from the balance sheets of global banks and now global shadow banks. Uh, and I would just say that uh, very quickly, the financial globalization uh, thesis, uh, neutrality thesis is wrong, uh, but particularly if we take into account the global dollar financial cycle uh, approach that Helene Ray introduced and is now becoming more and more popular. And that is not a global savings glad story. That is a story of the US dollar uh, money markets uh, being used by global financial institution, institutions in order to finance positions elsewhere. So instead of China exporting excess savings to the US, in this story, the US becomes a funding currency. And that's a very important uh, part of the story. When we look beyond the US, and I know Adam wants to go into that later, but I think it's important to remember that not everybody in the world lives in the US, although everybody in the world is somewhere or another influenced by what is happening in, in the US. Then what we have seen over the last 30 years is an, uh, with the increasing importance of the global dollar financial cycle is what I call an Amer Americanization of local financial systems in the sense that we have structural changes in finance whereby local, local financial systems look more and more like the, uh, the US financial system. And this has happened to accommodate the first the global banks uh, sort of portfolio management decisions and then uh, the uh, portfolio investors or the institutional investors uh, uh, portfolio decisions. So I think now we should be talking really about the portfolio glut rather than Shin's banking glut. Very quickly, Adam, two more minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, what happens if you tax capital inflows as proposed by uh, uh, Pettis and Klein? I think two things we need to take into account I, or we need to focus on. I don't think that the current account adjustments will be as automatic uh, as one would assume. We would have very important the fundamental restructuring of the global dollar financial cycle by going thinking very carefully what happens with a very significant demand for US assets that are financed or that are hedged through uh, US uh, FX swap markets. That's a very important element. The, the global dollar footprint, I think, would shrink significantly, and that's something good uh, in my view. Uh, and, and the second important thing is that we would reverse an, uh, the, the American, Americanization of local financial systems because we would basically shrink the global dollar footprint. And that matters to everybody who lives outside the US. Uh, just to give you very quickly, uh, uh, although the global uh, financial cycle literature focuses on the recipients of capital flows that are financed through US dollars, there is a very significant foreign demand for US dollar assets, and Brad can talk at, at length about it. But once you start taxing capital inflows into the US, you change dramatically the, the demand for this uh, global for these dollar assets, and you change dramatically the uh, way in which these are uh, financed from local currencies into the US dollars. Uh, it's a story that Brad has told, for example, uh, in relationship to Taiwanese insurers, but you can uh, talk about it. and. Uh, with Yanis Dafermos and Joe Michel, we're, we're working on a paper that looks through the, the implications of that. And second and very important is that a, a tax on capital inflows into the US that would make funding more expensive for uh, in the global dollar financial cycle would mean that we shrink portfolio inflows. And this is, I'm showing you here some graphs from a very recent Bank of England paper that shows very clearly the increasing importance of portfolio inflows in uh, emerging countries and, and the low income countries is increasing their vulnerability to the global dollar conditions. So that's a good story. And capital controls they show, and I, I think it's a very persuasive analysis, 
uh, on portfolio inflows in particular would shrink or, or reduce the act, uh, absolute volumes coming in and going out. And that we know from almost every emerging country's balance of payment crisis, that's a very important mechanism. So I'll stop here. Thank you. That, that was that was brilliant and, and thoroughly vindicated the decision to keep widening the scope of the debate because it's added in a sense a channel through which capital taxation might actually be a progressive policy move but not the one that Michael and Matt are proposing by way of the financial architecture which is hugely enlightening. I'm looking for other people obviously I know Michael and Matt would probably want to respond but I'm look I've got Brad I've got Mona I've got John in my eyes either any one of you want to jump in at this point Mona's uncovered so maybe Mona does. Um, hi, so can you all hi. hear me? Yes. Okay, good. lovely. Um, I guess I'm being going to be a little repetitive, but I think it's important to keep in mind that there are multinationals that are driving the Carnicon um, imbalances. I think it's essential to tax multinationals in order to deal with um, global inequality. But the way to do it would not be through implementing capital controls on US inflows. First of all, I, I think it's really broad net. You have a lot of round tripping, you have portfolio investment. Um, you also have official banks that are relying on dollar liquidity. So do we wanna cut all of that off? Um, I do understand the points, Daniela, that you made that reducing portfolio inflows is actually a good thing for the developing world. So I'm in favor of that. But I think there are other ways, which unfortunately, in this time look very difficult, but we, you know, they would involve multilateral uh, coordination. I think it's necessary to tax multinationals on a per country basis um, so that the tax revenues are more dispersed around the world and to close tax havens. So I think there are other more efficient and um, more necessary ways of reducing income inequality. Um, finally, I just want to reiterate what others have said, which is that the current account uh, is not a mechanistic um, outcome of financial, uh, you know, the financial accommodation view. So the current account has its own dynamics uh, that have to do with multinational, transnational production, um, that have to do with uh, the, the dollar, uh, the financial cycle, as you mentioned, uh, they have to do with the periphery, uh, depending on US absorption of its exports. Um, and, you know, I mean, we can cause the, the uh, current account to diminish uh, if we keep hammering away at it. Uh, but I think that will be devastating for the world economy that relies on the U.S. current account uh, and do a global dollar liquidity. All right, I'm going to shut up. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Mark. Did I see Brad? Did I see you signaling? Or I think Brad and then John, maybe in that order. Brad, can you, un can you unmute? I think I'm on, not on mute. Um, I guess my point of view is uh, a complex one uh, because I am the unreconstructed believer that the Asian savings glut is actually a useful analytical framework for starting one's analysis. Uh, I certainly believe it impacts the world uh, by price, by influencing exchange rates and by holding down consumption relative to income, and thus it affects real variables. But I, if you wanna understand the evolution of the global economy over the past 20 years, to me, the fact that East Asia's savings, so the combined savings of China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, had, went from little under 30% of their GDP in 2000 to 37, percent of their GDP in 2008 is central to understanding why Asia developed such a large current account surplus over that time period. It meant that as a practical matter, the earnings from China's export boom weren't recycled back into the global economy as imports. It meant that the large reserve accumulation in China wasn't as inflationary as it might otherwise have been. And equally, if you want to understand the post-crisis uh, evolution of the global economy, the increase in Asia's savings rate from 37 to over 40 percent, matched by a very large increase in Chinese investment, which drove a commodity price cycle and the like, strikes me as fundamental, not secondary. Uh, and I think looking at Asia's, the increase in Asia's savings rate 
lead you to look at a host of domestic policies inside China, inside Korea, inside Taiwan, and inside Japan for that matter, that have held down consumption relative to income. China has an incredibly regressive tax system. Its system of social contributions is miserly in the benefits it finances. Korea has a very dual labor market, very little income transfer to the low end of the population. So there's a set of domestic policy interventions to raise consumption that seem to me to flow directly from the insight that Asia's savings rate has gone from 30% of East Asia's economy. I mean, I'm using Asia as shorthand for Northeast Asia. And that that, given Asia's size and weight, has rather profound implications on income growth versus consumption, and also on the funds available circulating in the global economy through the buildup of financial assets amongst Asian countries. The fact that a lot of this was coming through the buildup of reserves in the run-up to the global crisis strikes me as fundamental, not secondary, but that's for a later conversation. Second point, and I think this gets at something that Nathan is discussing, is that if you go back to the kind of orthodox literature on how portfolio flows influence the real economy, the extreme position is that they don't. So the extreme position, the efficient markets hypothesis position, is that it doesn't matter, for example, whether Japan holds its reserves, which are large, in dollars or in euros. That if Japan buys dollars, a private investor will happily move to euros. There will be no movement in price because there's no change in information and basically nothing real adjust. The alternative view, which is the view I subscribe to, is that various variables will adjust, that there's not a frictionless financial market with private actors indifferent between holding dollars and euros. I'm very close to Danielle on this. And thus the exchange rate will adjust, which will impact real variables. And there will be shifts in financial conditions in the country receiving the inflows. And thus the shift in portfolio allocation and in the modern world economy, the big portfolios are often government portfolios, not private portfolios, can have a material impact on the real conditions that many people think drive the current account. Thank you, Brett. That was, that was uh, I'm tempted to ask you that should, were you to find yourself in the treasury purely hypothetically at some point in the future, whether, whether how the idea of a tax on capital inflows, you, how you would, how would you would, how you would imagine the idea of a tax on capital inflows would, would fall in that environment. But, but I won't press the point. Um, uh, uh, I wouldn't want you necessarily to be on the record on that issue. Um, John, do you want to? You've been very patient. Do you want to come in, Colby, Isabella? I've sure. Got you, I've got uh, you. If you if you don't mind, um, because Daniela has been accusing me of, of something, and I, I felt that I had to respond. Uh, I think my, my point to, and, and I think it follows up nicely from what Brad said, is is not that I believe in the efficient market hypothesis, but that, that I intermediated through a variable that we might call market liquidity, whereby you know, yes, this flows will affect you know Argentinian ability to spend quite a lot, um, but probably, and, and this was basically my point, in the case of U.S. Treasuries and this Bernanke idea that the Chinese flows you know affected the U.S. by lowering. The, the risk-free interest rate, I am extremely skeptical of that. Like I think the Fed has almost, uh, you know, absolute control over the nominal rate and, you know, very big control over the real rate as, as we've seen recently. Um, so so that, that being the point, uh, but, you know, because uh, Daniela uh, sort of showed us those straw men, I, I've been sort of soul searching a bit because I, I feel I feel mad felt that my reading of the book, which which I did read, uh, was a bit unfair. And I was trying to, to figure out like what, why that was. And I think what I came up with is, is that I feel the book is a bit of the synthesis between, you know, the, the sort of this mechanistic current account view that, that you know, Michael has written about many times and, and that I think was what prompted us to basically disagree with him and Matt's sort of Hobsonian view, which has to do with like con consumption and spending patterns. And, and this story is purely Keynesian, right? So I, 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 as Josh said, I don't see anything particularly wrong with it, even though I, I do want to say something about it too. Um, I, my issue was always with this idea that somehow these savings, because we should explain that in macroeconomic accounting, savings is just something that was produced and not consumed. So when it is said, no, these savings travel, you know, Germany exports and these savings travel to Spain, they don't travel. It's, it's, it's just, it, you're saying that uh, Germany ex exports, 
you're saying the same thing twice. There isn't like a causal mechanism by which these savings happen first and then make something happen. This is not like, it, it's not an equilibrium. Things are not balancing. They're true by definition. Um, so, so, but, but with this out of the way, um, the real sort of criticism that, that I, I, I made to the book and to Matt's position was that I felt, and I think he disagreed, that uh, the Hobsonian view of, of, you know, we should rebalance all these sort of trade imbalances by, you know, making those that don't spend enough spend more. Uh, while, you know, I think it could be true, particularly if you manage to, you know, reestablish some sort of bank or multilateral, uh, you know, FX management, you know, institution that, that makes these sort of foreign exchange wars stop, you could potentially do that. Um, but my criticism of it was that I felt that underneath it all, it was sort of trying to rescue this sort of Ricardian comparative advantage idea where like, you know, if trade, if trade balances, then, you know, the specialization, uh, like the, the international division of labor takes care of itself would be, would be the, the thesis, right? It's like, like Ricardo said, let the UK, you know, make, make textiles and let Portugal do wine. And, you know, everyone gains because they specialize on what they do best. Turns out, you know, textiles have, you know, a massive ability to produce dynamic productivity gains and focusing on making port is from a macroeconomic perspective, a terrible choice. Um, and I think we should avoid the flaw of assuming that, you know, this international division of labor will take care of itself. And I actually tend to think that, you know, after 2008, the, the fundamental debate we were all having was about monetary theory, was the money view, what was going on in repo. I think we need to have a fundamental debate about growth theory. And I see the, the tensions that are happening in the world now, uh, you know, from, from if you want from the perspective of, of the revenge of, of Raoul Prebisch, right? Like the, and, and sort of the dependency theory school and the idea that, you know, core periphery dynamics uh, matter. And the idea that where we are at is a result of a country like China, but also many other Asian nations like South Korea, essentially subverting this process, right? Subverting this Ricardian comparative advantage thesis and trying to scale up uh, the complexity chain of production through what has always been his historically. And we can think from, you know, the Marshall Plan to, uh, you know, that, like the, the Nazi German economy about which Adam has written a lot to Japan's development after the fifties. We can think of many examples and they will all point us to the fact that in order for a country to be rich, what you need to do is make ever more complex products and export them abroad. And I think here is where, you know, the two views are not exactly equivalent. And the reason for that being that what we're really talking about is, is, is not that you could, as the sort of naive Hobsonian story uh, would tell you, embrace Fordism, right? We're like, yeah, let's just all raise, raise our wages and we will, we will you know, we will buy that excess production domestically. So we will fix all these imbalances. Uh, this is a nice story, but, and, and I think it could be true to an extent, and it has been historically true, but I don't think it's a coincidence that all these developing countries have discovered that in order to validate capital expenditure, which, which is the real driver of saving, it is not a balancing, right? It, it, it's not, saving is not channeled into capital expenditure. All these countries have engaged in trade industrial policies and they've created this massive capital expenditure programs. And in order to validate it, they've needed foreign demand. And I think that the reality of actual trade, which involves economies of scale, oligopolies, as Mona was saying, trans, transnational corporations, uh, they impede the easy Ricardian Hobsonian synthesis from being a solution to our problems. So even if you were to nominally fix nominal imbalances, I don't think you would fix the fundamental challenge of our age, which is one of the countries has made a claim to escape the periphery and has made a claim that has destabilized, not just economically, but also geopolitically and mil in a military sense, uh, the global hegemon, still not to a, to a dangerous extent perhaps, but it has definitely escaped the straight jacket where everyone, and, and I think Adam, you've said, well, this wasn't a naive modernization theory belief that people were holding when they negotiated China's entry into WTO. Perhaps not, but I do think that they fundamentally did not understand that historically this was the path to development and one that China would not be able to give up on. And to me, <laughs> this is uh, quite an interesting part of the story that is kind of direct, you know, yeah. the, 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 tra the trade wars are, are, are sort of, the class wars is interesting and it's part of it, but it, it misdirects from another very important part of it. That would Thank be you. my argument. Thank you very much, John. That was fantastic. Again, another huge angle. I know we still have Colby and Isabella to bring into the conversation. We've been talking about Argentina on and off. Colby, I've got my eye on you. But I think at this point, we really do have to give Matt, Michael, one or either or both of you a chance to respond.
briefly, if you, if you, if you, if I can plead with you uh, to pick your, take your pick of the range of, 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 of provocations that have been offered. And thank you for so, being so patient in, 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 uh, in, uh, Thank you. Well, I find myself in the odd position of vehemently agreeing with people who claim they vehemently disagree with me. So, um, you know, just to sort of briefly go through these things, um, Josh makes the point about how trade is ultimately based on, you know, the, the, what matters are the prices and, you know, income growth. And that's why, you know, the ultimate effect. And, you know, we agree, we talk about this. I mean, I would, I would change income slightly to talk about domestic demand, but because um, income and domestic demand can be different. And that's, you know, why you have trading policies in the first place. Um, but that, you know, is essentially our view. And in fact, we trace through the book exactly like why that follows through. Um, to, to Mona's point about transnational corporations, I mean, there's certainly a lot of interesting wrinkles that show up in the balance of payments of the consequences. And, you know, Brad spent a lot of time tracing this and we talked about some of this in the book, but at least in the perspective of the United States, if you have the sort of exploitative relationships, then the trade deficit is essentially offset by an income surplus. And so for the current account as a whole, you know, there has to be some other, you know, additional factors going on. And I think that's why it's really important to look at sort of other countries and, you know, what's specifically happening in certain places. Um, you know, John made the point, which I think is is interesting. And I think it, it, it you know, I read the book. I mean, we, we talk a lot about, you know, the importance of development models and how this works. And I, I want to spend some time on this because I think it's not really the right story here. So the most successful example of export-led growth in the history of the world is South Korea. And South, South Korea was the poorest country in the world by most standards in the early 1950s. Partly that was a legacy of being essentially wiped out in the Korean War in terms of all the physical infrastructure. It's now basically GDP per capita on par with France. Now, how did that happen? It happened because, as, as John correctly notes, there was a concerted developmental push by the government of South Korea to focus on getting businesses to produce for rich goods for richer countries because the domestic market was too poor to absorb them. They had to invest, and there was a lot of effort and interesting stuff. And that, in turn, was based on earlier policy interventions that were done by MITI in Japan. You can even argue, um, well, but yeah, MITI in Japan sort of being the, the sort of classic example they were following. And yet, up until the Asian financial crisis, which I think is a really important hinge point here, South Korea ran consistent trade and current account deficits continuously. That industrialization of South Korea, the export-led growth, the export, you know, trying to, you know, make goods that were acceptable and, and quality for richer markets than they had themselves, and using export markets as a source of, you know, competitive innovation so that domestic oligopolies wouldn't just completely, you know, not invest in productivity, it was perfectly consistent with a net trade deficit, with a current account deficit. And the reason, I, of course- I'm Sorry, I was actually going to bring that up. And I think it's very interesting what you say, precisely because I don't think that balancing it changes the fact. Like, it, you know, it, it, that, that, is, that was exactly to my point. Like, you might balance it, but you might still have the China, the China challenge in the same way. Well, Just I mean, you're talking about the Korea. political challenge of, or military. I mean, but the, the broader point of, the, of what we're saying is that you can't, we cannot ascribe trade surpluses to a developmental strategy based on export-led growth. There's something else that's going on there. You know, you can also look at the United States, which again, the United States, and you know, Ricard, we, we talk about Ricardo in the book, we basically say that Ricardo's theory, um, you know, the assumptions that Ricardo himself described, which apparently a lot of economists who talk about comparative advantage have sort of forgotten about them, those assumptions include things like no capital mobility. And in fact, he explicitly said in, in um, you know, his book when he ex explained the comparative advantage, which he didn't call it then, but that you know, if capital mobility would be bad, that, you know, the rational thing would be you would make the textiles and the wine in Portugal that, you know, because the, the, the that, that, like, you just move it. And he said, it's a good thing that English people can't do that because, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, luckily they're too afraid of moving their stuff abroad. And obviously we've seen, you know, the world change. In fact, Hamilton, who wrote before and his, you know, report on manufacturing essentially was, you know, anticipated and, and responded to this, which is, you no, know, actually, we can induce foreigners to invest in our country and, and move the capital abroad if, you know, we couldn't generate a high enough return for them. And you can, you can see that sort of as a chain of, of processes, um, you know, people following that various countries, I should say, following that model repeatedly over time. And doing so, by the way, while having trade deficits and therefore sort of contributing on net to global demand by spending more than they're producing domestically, as opposed to the other way around. Um, what's interesting is, you know, so why did it change? Like, look at the Korea example, look at the China example, I think is, is quite relevant here. What changed was that, you know, again, the, the financial account, you know, primacy, I think, being relevant here. Once you experience the Asian financial crisis, which is, in other words, you're, you, you are running these trade deficits continuously, and it seems to be working out very well for you. But then for whatever reason, 
you know, a change in external financial conditions makes that no longer possible to the same degree that it was. And it comes with all sorts of political intervention and so forth. You are naturally going to respond if you're a government and probably you're going to have support of, of people inside your country for doing this in a way to prevent that from happening. And you're going to be focusing on how can you pr- create yourself, you know, financial insurance. And the most straightforward way to do that is to accumulate larger and larger pools of foreign currency reserves. You might now, that can be the driver. And then as a consequence, that can do things like depress the value of exchange rate, and that can lead to trade surpluses sort of necessarily, you know, how are you accumulating these reserves on net? And then that's a clear situation where um, certainly in the case of, I think, Korea and China, which was observing this from a distance, you know, you see what happens in Indonesia where Suharto had been in charge for decades. And then, you know, the IMF comes in, that's all gone, right? If you're the Communist Party, you surely are going to be paying attention to that example quite closely. And then you have a situation where, you know, up until that point, and I'm sure Michael can speak to this in more detail, but there were a lot of people within the Chinese leadership who were thinking, oh, more open capital account would be good. And, you know, that goes into reverse and, you know, the determination to maintain the, you know, yuan peg to the dollar increases. And then, you know, that leads to a whole chain of events, which happens to then lead to a growing and growing trade surplus, which becomes increasingly inconvenient um, for the Chinese government for various reasons. So, I think it's useful to have this sort of, you know, perspective on, on, on you know, in the role of industrialization and growth models. I mean, it gets back to, you know, what Michael was saying at the very beginning. The reward for, you know, moving up the value chain should be you're able to consume more. You have higher living standards for your people. It shouldn't be that you have this big stockpile of savings that you need to accumulate because you're afraid that it will turn around. And I think that's really important to have this perspective. Thank you, Matt. That was great. Michael, do you want to come back on some of the points that were raised? Otherwise, I'm going to look around and bring some more folks in. Yes, I, I, I'd like to, I'll try to do this uh, fairly uh, quick, Adam. I, I'd like Thank to uh, respond to, I guess, a number of the comments. Um, the, the first, I guess, is uh, Nathan on whether or not uh, taxes on inflows are likely to reduce inflows. And I think, you know, I, I, I agree with Daniela very much that one of our big handicaps, one of the big handicaps economists have is that they don't really look outside of the United States there is a pretty ample history of taxes on capital inflows and on capital outflows, but let's focus on the inflows. And I know the the more recent ones uh, from memory, um, so I'm probably only going to focus or mostly on on the more recent ones, but there are some older ones. In 1937, Switzerland imposed taxes on inflows that were quite successful. We don't want to ask too many questions about why they did that, but nonetheless, they did that. We forget that the U.S. had taxes on inflows. In fact, it was only in 1983 that we eliminated the withholding tax on foreign ownership of American stocks and bonds. And in his book, uh, which I'm just reading now, Clashing Over Commerce, Doug Irwin, who I don't think is particularly sympathetic to to the idea of either taxing uh, 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 imports or taxing inflows, Uh, argues that it was the elimination of those capital controls that were responsible for the massive increase in the American trade imbalances. In 1991, Matt already mentioned this, Chile imposed first a 20% and then a year later a 30% reserve requirement at zero interest rates. Brazil in 2009 had a 2% and then in 2010 a 6% tax on portfolio inflows. Thailand in 2010, Taiwan in 2012. I mean, there's a long history of this. And the conclusion most economists who have studied it uh, 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 is that they've been fairly effective. The biggest criticism is that short-term capital controls tend to be more damaging after the controls are, are, uh, are, are eliminated. But long-term capital controls seem to have worked. So I think, you know, I think capital controls, taxes on capital inflows, there is a history of them working. Now, um, a, a second point which Nathan makes, and, and Josh, and, and I guess uh, John, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed at this, which is that the argument in that particular piece, which was quite a short piece, assumed a mechanistic relationship between the capital account and the current account. I'm sorry, but that is simply not true. What the article says is that capital inflows cause adjustments in the American economy, which then lead to adjustments in the current account. But because I've discussed them so many times before, I won't discuss them here. And then I link to other discussions. And in the other discussions, they say, it says that one of the mechanisms could be changes in the value of the currency. Another could be through wealth effects. 
A third could be through unemployment. It could affect it through fiscal deficits, household debt, lowered lending standards. And I gave examples, again, not all American, I, I do look outside, of, uh, of cases uh, uh, in which that happens. So the point there is that nowhere, and certainly not in the book, do we assume that there's a mechanistic relationship. That's nonsense. In fact, nobody would make that assumption. I think it's a bit of a straw mat. Um, there cannot be. There has to be an adjustment process. Um, I, I agree with, uh, with Daniela that, uh, as I said, that much of our discussion is handicapped by an inability to look outside of the U.S. But another point that she makes, which I agree with, but I interpret it a little bit differently, is she says that uh, uh, imposing taxes on capital inflows would undermine the role of the dollar as the dominant reserve currency. Now, as Matt and I have discussed many times before, we don't really see that as a problem. In fact, we see that as one of the goals. As I mentioned earlier on, I'm a big buyer of Keynes's proposal during, uh, during Bretton Woods, which among other things, he argued that we didn't want a, uh, the, the currency of any country to be the dominant reserve currency. We wanted something like Bancor that had a whole different set of constraints. So yes, I agree 100% that taxing capital inflows will undermine the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. I don't see that as a bad thing for the US, perhaps for the world, because there will be a difficult adjustment. Um, I'm not going to comment <clears throat> on anything Brad said, because as usual, I don't really disagree with anything that, uh, that, that he said. Um, uh, 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 John, unfortunately, because of a bad connection, I, I couldn't hear everything that he said. I think he argued that a lot of growth is due to export orientation, and that's fine. We agree completely. Our problem is not that an export orientation doesn't lead to rapid growth. Our problem is that an export orientation leads to imbalances that are pushed abroad to other countries. It's like uh, any form of a beggar thy neighbor policy. Nobody would argue that beggaring thy neighbor reduces growth. No, it increases growth. That's the whole point, but it works to the extent that there is no, uh, 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 that nobody cares, that you're able to do so uh, and, and get away with it. Now, one thing, again, I'm not sure whether or not you said this, uh, John, but you argued that China is very unlikely to want to change its model, and that is simply not true. Um, in May, uh, 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 um, Xi Jinping gave a speech, which we now realize was an extremely important speech, talking about the so-called dual circulation model. In June, um, uh, Li He then made the same speech. And since then, almost every day, uh, there have been articles in the People's Daily and the Politburo made an announcement on July 30th of the same thing. They're talking about this new dual circulation model. And there's nothing new about it. It's been given a, good na a new name because it's part of Xi Jinping's signature proposals. This is really a rehash of Wen Jiabao's proposal back in 2007 about rebalancing, but it's taken on additional urgency. And Michael, let, let, me, is... let me rephrase what I said so, so we argue against what I actually believe. Uh, what I believe is that no institution like a WTO or you know, the priority of rebalancing will, be, will come before China's need to continue escalating on the value chain. That is what I believe. It is possible they will rebalance, as you say, they're talking about it right now, just that. Well, I think it's very difficult for them to rebalance, not for economic reasons, but for political reasons. Remember, they've talked about rebalancing since 2007. Since then, uh, the household income share of GDP, this is 13 years, has risen by two percentage points. Uh, it's a real problem for them, but they recognize that the existing growth model has reached its limitations. They do not want to continue it. It's politically very, very difficult to, to, uh, to adjust their model, and that's why it's, uh, it, they've had so much trouble doing so. But Xi Jinping and the Politburo have made very, very clear that they absolutely must rebalance the economy away from what they call international circulation towards internal circulation. That's why they have it. They give that uh, uh, bizarre name of dual circulation. But anyway, let me, uh, let me stop there. Thank, thank, thank you, Michael. We, we, many of us have at various stages said, you know, it's very important to try and talk about things other than the United States, or at the very least to place the American experience against the backdrop and in the context of, of an understanding of the global system, another experience. And I wonder whether I can, 
I can bring uh, Colby uh, Smith and Isabella Kaminska into the conversation here. Um, Colby, you've been covering the EM beat, the debt crisis beat for the Financial Times in recent years. How does this conversation sound to you when you, when you hear this conversation about uh, taxation on capital flows in the United States um, and the broader well, analysis that Matt yeah. and Michael are offering? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I've primarily tended to focus on Argentina just for the last uh, few months or, or years, really, since that's how long the situation has been dragging on. And for me, um, I mean, Argentina seems to be kind of the quintessential example here in how quickly things can go awry um, for, you know, uh, low uh, a country, a dollar denominated emerging market economy that has um, low levels of savings, low levels of exports. And the destabilizing effects of, of a shift in, in confidence from investors um, is, is quite noticeable just in, in the last crisis here. And this is a situation that Argentina has been in time and time again. I mean, the most recent default in the spring was its uh, ninth default since independence um, in the 1800s. In the past 60 years, it's had something like over 20 programs with the IMF. So unfortunately, this is a situation that Argentina has found itself in. Um, time and time again. Um, and the most recent crisis was kind of um, a, a real, a really a similar story. I mean, here we have a, a country that has long been plagued by, you know, high inflation, by an underdeveloped domestic capital markets, by, um, you know, a citizenry that had a penchant for holding dollars. Um, there was not enough savings um, and there was low levels of exports and, and limited exports that were typically focused on the commodity sector. And that was the situation in the state of play when Macri became president in 2015. And he was kind of billed as this pro-reform, pro-market candidate that investors became enraptured with. And one of his first um, policy changes was to remove the capital control that had been in place for, uh, for years. And he was able to facilitate Argentina's return to uh, global capital markets by resolving a longstanding feud with some holdout creditors from the 2001 default. And, you know, Argentina quickly kind of took advantage of the fact that it had this access again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in 2016, 2017, it was raising billions and billions of dollars from overseas investors by issuing dollar denominated debt. Um, I mean, they did this through the century bond, which I think a lot of people would like to, to forget at this time, but that was in, in 2017 that it was able to, uh, to do that. Um, and uh, I mean, this resulted in an overvalued peso and the imports, um, the dollars raised were being used to pay for, for the imports as opposed to kind of building up the coffer of FX reserves um, or, you know, to be put to use in more productive sectors. Um, and so uh, with, you know, the increase in interest payments, what this resulted in was a, um, a pretty significant rise in the current account deficit. And I, between 2016, 2017, I think we saw a near doubling of the deficit um, and uh, to about 5% of GDP, which mm -hmm. was a significant move. Um, and on top of that, uh, the government was kind of a little bit too gradual in a way um, in, in narrowing the, the budget deficit at the same time, which was kind of a key pillar. And so what this, you know, the situation created for Argentina was that it became incredibly vulnerable to a sudden stop of capital flows. And that's exactly what we started to see in 2018. Um, there was, you know, some concern about central bank credibility there was a drought that was, um, you know, weighing on growth. Um, and at the same time, the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates. And so that changed the calculus and the appetite in some way for investor appetite for, for not only Argentine assets, but EM assets more broadly. Um, and this kind of created a perfect storm. I mean, when you had an overvalued peso, that's kind of where the, those first pressures showed up. And it mm -hmm. wasn't long um, into 2018 that the, the fund, uh, that the, the Argentina had to go to the fund for a $50 billion bailout package. And investors initially were, were pleasantly surprised by the size of the package. It was a record, it was a record one for the fund. Um, it was more than I think had been initially expected. And it really rattled investors when just a few months later, um, you know, investor sentiment had again turned on emerging markets. The Turkish lira was kind of wrapped up in a broad based sell off. Um, and Macri, you know, had to make a public plea that there just wasn't sufficient, the current um, bailout plan wasn't sufficient and it had to be upsized. So, I mean, I think in, in many ways, um, Argentina is kind of like that classic uh, 
uh, case where um, these types of destabilizing capital flows um, can can really detrimentally impact um, an economy and the and the, the livelihoods of, of people involved. And, and it's it's just ironic that one of the last kind of uh, policy measures that Macri ended up putting into place after he was um, he uh, lost the primary election in, in August to the of last year to the the Peronist candidate was capital troll, uh, controls again. And mm. um, it was just days after that that, you know, he announced that Argentina would have to postpone payments on its debts and um, rethink its uh, its uh, deal with the IMF. And here we are a year later, and we um, finally ha have some kind of agreement with um, bondholders to a certain extent. I mean, that still has to be finalized um, next week, but the, the kind of real conversation starts with the fund, which um, of which Argentina owes 44 billion. So, I mean, just in about kind of five years time, Argentina has gone through this cycle once again. And, and I think it's a it's a really important kind of example to keep in mind as to um, how kind of debilitating some of these capital flows can, can really be. Yeah, it's extraordinary uh, the way in which the Latin American Asian contrast has become starker and starker and starker in terms of coping strategies and resilience in the face of these shocks. I want to, I finally, and it's, it's taken far too long, and apologies Isabella, but I, I want to put, put a question to you, which as, a, as, a, as an avid reader of the Alphaville blog, um, uh, is sort of on the tip of my tongue, which is, can you believe where we've ended up? I mean, when you started on that paper in that slot in 2008, as you yourself said, it's like, you know, joy to be a financial blogger in that position at that moment. And the way in which you and your team have tracked these debates as they've unfolded over recent years, it seems to me really quite as a historian, speaking as a sort of somebody interested in the history of economic thought and thinking about policy, as Daniela was saying, earlier on in just an offhand comment, it's extraordinary the degree to which the conversation has shifted, um, not just amongst the heterodox, but in fact, in some ways, more surprisingly, amongst the BIS, amongst the IMF, in your own newspaper, I mean, spectacularly in your own newspaper. Um, and in a sense, we've all undergone a kind of emerging market transition. It's like a provincialization of, of the Washington consensus model towards a kind of general agreement on some sort of Beijing light, um, which, which I find, I mean, it must have been remarkable to witness. Um, and you started, didn't you, in a, in a, originally part of your beat was both fossil fuels, but you were also doing Eastern Europe to an extent. Is that, is that my, is that a correct memory on my part? I mean, Alphaville doesn't have beats, so we kind of go wherever we, wherever we, you know, feel there's something going on. I just want to say hi to Max. I haven't seen him for ages, and it's nice to see him. Um, yeah, but, many alumni uh, here, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Colby, actually, hi. <laughs> but, um, I mean, <laughs> it's a really good point. Like, things have, the normalization of concepts that were just not conceivable when, and even in, like, 2008, 2009, even 2010, you know, we've gone from like, when I started at the FT, you, if anyone had raised the concept of the collapse of the euro currency, I mean, that in itself was an absurd con concept. Um, you had, I mean, aside from like cryptocurrency crazy stuff as well, but, but I mean, we've gone through a complete upheaval, but yet when you look on the longer, and if you, if you take a longer sort of view at it, it's, it, it's not that we haven't been here before. It's just things had normalized to a point where I think we got complacent and we thought we like sorted all these problems and then all of a sudden they're back again. Mm -hmm. And that's why in terms of this conversation, what, you know, everybody makes extremely valid and very, you know, stimulating points. But what I'm interested in is where are we going? Where are we, what's happening next? I mean, we, no one has really touched on the, on the impact of the, of the pandemic, right? This changes everything in my point of view. Um, it also potentially changes, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to hear your views. I think it possibly changes the rules of the game. Um, we are going into a sort of perpetual debt situation of multi-generational kind of, multi-generational sort of stuff. Um, you know, I was just speaking to Joseph actually about Argentina and like, at what point do we just write, you know, at what point do these imbalances have to just be struck out um, because they're not conceivably correctable? 
And how do you go about that without all sorts of terrible implications? And, and you know, you can't just, you know, there's a popular concept of like, you know, we'll just cancel the debt, but you can't just cancel the debt because then you cancel everyone's savings as well. People forget mm -hmm. about the other side of the coin. So the pandemic has like radicalized, I think, what's on the table even more so than, um, you know, what, what was going into the pandemic. But um, what, I, what I'm thinking, especially when I think about Argentina, I think about sort of states that are going to be perpetually indebted and it's hard to envisage how they can ever get out of this vicious circle. You know, is there, and, and I, I wrote a post recently, and I know this is kooky and a lot of people think it's kooky and I agree it's kooky, but I did mention these imperial Chinese bonds from like, uh, Tracy Alloway has always also been doing some stuff on that. But, you know, we're in this, we're in this era now where all sorts of, you know, pre, pre-modern age sins are on the table again. If we're, you know, we're looking Straight we're out of Hobson. Yeah, I mean, we're- Straight we're, literally we're, out of the age of John Hobson. Yeah. I mean, if we're, because you're talking, this is fundamentally about equality. What causes the inequality and how do we perpetuate and how do we allow an equalization? Well, you know, in, in some ways I would say there is a entrenchment because of the fact that it goes back to imperial times. I mean, that's like, you know, unpopular to say, but I think we can't forget that. And that's kind of come back in the in the culture sort of circles, but it's on the table now. Um, so what is, and then we've got these imperial bond debts. So if, you, if you're responsible for the sins of your forefathers, are you responsible for the, for the claims of your forefathers? You know, I'm Polish, reparations are a very, you know, it's a continuing thing in Poland. Everyone's always trying to claim their pre-communist uh, property back. Is that how you rebalance things? How do you rebalance things? Or maybe, maybe the maybe it's about creating some sort of debt structure which accounts for the times that you're down in, 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 like you're not capable of paying off your debt. Maybe that should be factored in. That you know, every contract is negotiable at the end of the day, and mm -hmm. a, a practical lawyer knows that. Um, you can't enforce on a contract if the person hasn't got the capacity to pay. And it's morally wrong to impoverish a nation um, or collapse a nation. I mean, that's what we learned from the European crisis. I mean, you can't destroy Greece for the sake of balancing the system, right? So, I mean, you can, but it's arguably not ethical. So is there some sort of debt instrument that can account for this sort of situation and pause payments until the country is back in a sort of positive cash flow GDP structure. And, and um, I mean, please stop me if I'm going crazy, because I, I always put crazy things on the table, but, but it, it came to my mind because of these Chinese imperial bonds, which everybody says are kooky, but in one way, um, and yes, you know, these bondholders, the, you know, who benefits really. But my point with that is simply, if you're going to have Sovereigns are not like conventional debt holders, right? They are, they are multi-generational entities. And mm -hmm. perhaps it's not crazy that you have a de debt instrument that can sort of become less burdened, like so you don't have to pay it when your country is down, but mm -hmm. then you pay it when, you're, when your country recovers. So arguably, you know, the, the, the imperial bondholders would say, well, China is now in a capacity where it can pay that debt. It couldn't before. So it was odious debt potentially, but now it can, so it should. I well, don't know. Uh, sorry, Th those are completely yeah. off tangent. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> I think they're incredibly provocative. Colby, do you want to jump in straight on that? On that. Yeah. The, so I mean, just Izzy, when you were talking, I mean, I immediately went to the fact that the G20 has been trying uh, for the past few months to, you know, corral private creditors and, and countries that that you know couldn't access financial markets to raise capital to kind of bridge um, the, the gap when coronavirus um, you know emerged um, earlier this year that they um, to, to suspend the debt payments and I think it's been really interesting to kind of watch the progress there because um, it's it's kind of failed to a certain degree I mean the G20 was hoping um, to have I think it was um, something like 11 billion of bilateral debt repayments to be suspended for countries. And I think they've only gotten about 5 billion as it stands. And no country has asked for similar treatment 
from private creditors themselves. And I remember just when that initial proposal came out, I mean, there was tons of pushback from private investors who said, we can't do a, a kind of broad reaching standstill. It has to be country by country. There were concerns about if you're gonna ask for a standstill, does that mean we can't trust you again? I mean, there were tons of kind of moral kind of questions that arose from those types of conversations. And um, I, I think that Corona has, um, you know, prompted discussions that may not have happened in the past, just given the severity of the situation. But um, there is a kind of whole edifice supporting the current structure as it stands, where you have these very long drawn out debt restructuring negotiations. And the concept of a, of a standstill is, um, is um, a quite uh, remote one. I mean, Ecuador comes to mind as one of the more successful cases here. I mean, they just finished their deal mm -hmm. and successfully um, were able to restructure without um, without actually a technical default there. But um, that is um, certainly the exception, not, not the rule at this stage. Daniela, you wanted to come in. Yes, I wanted to add to something Colby said about the fact that uh, emerging and poor countries, very paradoxically, I've seen many uh, sort of very reluctant to take out these uh, sort of options of suspending uh, interest payments. And to me, that harks back to the notion of uh, let's think through financial globalization as the starting mm -hmm. point and let, let's think through this idea of the portfolio glut. Because at the same time, the G20 is selling developing countries the stories the story that you need to develop your local currency bond markets and you need to bring portfolio flows in in order to help your uh, look the, the development of your local productive capacity in order to achieve the sustainable development goals so the story here to me uh, and in the case of argentina too and I, I hate to disagree with you colby but i don't think the story of why macri went wrong is because he didn't tighten fiscal policy enough to me the story of macri going wrong is precisely a story of opening up to global financial flows at the wrong time at the, at the wrong moment and for the wrong reasons. But anyways, I, going back to the, to the story that we are looking at now, the story of, of emerging countries and poor countries is a story of the G20 pushing the portfolio or trying to solve the, the portfolio glut by making by pushing these portfolio inflows into, into poor countries. And of course, what else can they do? They say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to, to default on my payments or to suspend my payments because then how am I going to sell my or preserve my credibility and issue bonds at 7% uh, in dollars instead of 14, which is what uh, I don't know, uh, I think uh, Ghana did this year uh, in Egypt as well, within, within months of getting support from the IMF. So the story here is very complicated. And I think one of the panelists here, and maybe we can spend some time discussing that, is where is the class aspect here? And we mm -hmm. haven't talked enough about class and about distribution. And I think one can tell a story of, of distribution starting from accounting identities, but one can also tell a, a story of distribution asking where does this portfolio glut come from? Where do, and, and this to me is a story of income inequality, uh, it's not only sovereign wealth funds that are moving portfolio flows uh, around, but it's also high net worth individuals. There Family are some offices. Uh, exactly some eye watering trillions moving around or, or looking for a productive placement that are coming from the one percent. Probably some some living close to you, Adam, in New York. Uh, that's one. No, they're on the other side of town. Okay. No, we might be one percent, but you're talking about zero point zero one percent. Yes. Family. No. I I know. I am part Different of the three percent, and and I realize. I mean, I come from a working class family in Romania, and I realize as as a university lecturer that has a wage that is way above the average wage in the UK, and that has a private uh, that has a pension fund that is investing on my behalf. Mm -hmm. I am part of the 3% and that's a yeah. difficult conversation to have here because if we really want to get to the bottom of how this system might change and what are the causal yeah. mechanisms be behind financial globalization, it is also a story of the state giving up collective provision of public goods, yeah. uh, move, moving towards asset-based welfare, moving towards private pensions, moving towards private health, moving towards private education. And the G20 is not doing anything to stop that. It's actually reinforcing those trends. So the, the politics has to come in, and that's where the class is hidden in the politics of what's behind these causal mechanisms. I think there are two dimensions of power that it would be good if we could, in the final stages of the conversation, to address. One is the inequality, as it were, the intranational. And the other one is the is the clearly latent issue of global power and international power that was is so nicely symbolised by Isabella's instance of these odious debts from the really the, the high point of the period of humiliation of China at the hands of Western power shortly after the Boxer uprising. And the and the coalition in, intervention, and I, I think that 
sits in the background of so much of this conversation, conceived in different ways, whether through Matt and Michael's story or through John's much more explicitly industrial policy, national competition. But anyway, Brad, I know you wanted to hop in on this conversation. So uh, I'm going to bring things down to practical nitty gritty because, uh, you know, Adam deals in high concepts and I deal with brass tacks. Oh, yeah. Um, problem number one, uh, and I think Daniela's argument about a portfolio glut is relevant here, is that that's a description of the world that existed pre-COVID-19. Post-COVID-19, foreign investors have fled local currency markets fled massively in the first quarter and have not come back in the second quarter. They've perhaps come back into the hard currency market, but not the local currency market. So to the extent that the G20 was hoping that local currency flows could substitute for uh, aid, concessional financing and the like, they're wrong. Simply put, it's not going to work. Second point is that the G20 debt suspension initiative was poorly conceived. The notion that countries would find it in their interest to restructure all of their private sector bonds for six months of relief doesn't make sense. The transaction cost of a restructuring exceed the likely flow benefits. If you want countries to restructure, there has to be a much more comprehensive deal at the other end of the table. And then if you think about power, we also have to think about Chinese power. And the Chinese were not willing participants, let's say, at the beginning of the initiative, and they've constantly sought to narrow its scope. And one of the big difficulties is the bulk of the uh, official debt rescheduling would be done by China. And China is arguing, using its power in a sense, that what you think of as Chinese state development lenders, we think of as commercial creditors. At this therefore, moment, anyway. At this moment, right? In this context. <laughs> In this context. So therefore, China is using its structural power to define the China Development Bank as a commercial lender that would be exempt from the application of that suspension initiative. And the Western countries, G20 rich countries, however you want to define it, are in a weak position because they haven't insisted that their commercial creditors participate. So this initiative which had some promise, needs to be rethought. Thanks. Yes, Matt. And please, everyone should just feel free to jump in in this final stage. Cause... So the uh, the first thing I was thinking when Izzy was talking about the, the appeal of having debt that is more flexible is that, you know, we, we are, these instruments exist, the GDP warrants, and they just are historically unpopular. And the reason they tend to be unpopular is that governments always try to issue them at the worst possible time. So there's never really been the chance for a market to develop. So Argentina has tried to do this. Greece, you know, Yanis Varoufakis proposed doing this. And, you know, it usually countries, you know, governments propose these things when they're already basically in default. So that unfortunately, but I completely agree that you could have alternative mechanisms. And in fact, Michael's first book, The Volatility Machine, is in some ways an extended, you know, thought about, you know, how to make debt structures and fiscal balance sheets more um, resilient for these kinds of things. Uh, in terms of the class dimensions, though, which is something, you know, it's the key title of, you know, part of the book, and I think part of our overall argument here is I, com I completely agree that there, there's a, you know, we have to think about in this context, as, as Daniela was saying, the the changes within countries, particularly rich countries, but not only rich countries, because you know we spent a lot of time talking about China and it's relevant there as well, have led to, on the one hand, the concentrations of income that among entities that are more likely to want to accumulate financial assets than spending on goods and services, and you know at the same time, you know the sort of the, the immediate corollary is, is reduction in global demand that you know has to be met you know sort of from income that has to be met with debt rising somewhere else. And, you know, we can see this playing out within countries in terms of the, the trade balance between countries, which is, you know, a lot of how we frame the book, but also we can look at it in the context of, you know, the, the situation with Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. If Argentina, the government, were spending less money on in interest payments to on debts that are predominantly owned by very wealthy investors in the United States and elsewhere, that would then recycle that into other financial asset and accumulation, and instead we're spending more at home, in ways that ended up benefiting people in Argentina and giving them more income. And they would spend on more goods and services, some of which would be produced in Argentina, most of which would be produced in Argentina, but some of which would be produced outside of Argentina. And that would actually increase global demand and ultimately redound to the benefit of you know, 
non-rich people in the United States. So even from the perspective of what's good for the United States or not, we have to look, you know, countries, one of the fundamental parts of our analysis in this book is that countries aren't really the right unit of analysis here. Mm-hmm. That, you know, saying that this is Argentina versus the U.S. and, oh, it's, you know, North versus South and in the global system is not really the right way of thinking about that. In many cases, the interests of most Americans and the interests of most people in the global South are the same, just as the interests of ultra elite Americans and rich people in the global South also tend to be the same. And you can in fact, look at the entire international financial system as reflecting that. And so, you know, it, it, I think it's very useful for, you know, we, we try to describe this in the book. I mean, a, admittedly, not as much in sort of the context of you know, what's going on in Argentina now, but I mean, it's very helpful, I think, to, to frame it this way. And we talk about it, you know, for example, you know, Chinese manufacturers pay extraordinarily low wages relative to the value of what they produce. And yeah, some of that redounds to the benefit of the Chinese state and rich people in China, but it also redounds to the benefit of multinational companies that set up operations in China. And who's harmed by that? Well, obviously Chinese workers are harmed by that. And also workers in the rest of the world that either are sort of forced to compete with these low wages or just, you know, there isn't as much global demand for goods and services as a consequence. So it's very helpful, you know, I think analytically. And in fact, you really can't really understand what's going on in the global economy without the sort of you know, sectoral basis in terms, you know, a country consists of, of, of multitudes and you really have, it really, it helps to break it down and understand you know, all the moving parts. I think Josh, 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 do you want to come in? Yes, I just wanted to jump in because I think Matthew just put his finger on one of the real fundamental divides here, which is this question of whether North versus South inequality is still a relevant dimension. Of course, there's the other dimension, intra-country inequality, but, but I think, and I think maybe many of us on this side think that the North versus South divide is also fundamentally important and that, and that creating more space for, for developing countries is a very good and important thing. I mean, early on, Matthew compared, um, he talked about carbon emissions and like the US tax and financial influences like protecting ourselves from carbon emissions from the rest of the world. In my view, the United States is is by far the world's greatest financial carbon emitter, and and the rest of the world desperately needs to protect itself. I think U.S. policy over the last 70 years has been very bad in many dimensions and has created an enormous amount of, of, of the inequality that, that Matthew's talking about in poverty are the direct results of, of U.S. policy. And I think the fact that other countries in the world are beginning to create more space for themselves and free themselves a bit from US dominance is a very, very good thing for humanity. And so when I look at something like reserve accumulation in East Asia, I see them protecting themselves from our financial carbon emissions and protecting themselves from the kind of instability and, and financial vulnerability that, that was kind of forced on them by the Washington consensus and by the US so, you know, Senate trade system. I, I agree with that, to be clear. Yeah. And I, th- I think that, you know, it's just, again, useful to say that you know, what is the, the, that Washington consensus was driven by, I think, in many ways, you know, sort of the financial elite and sort of industri- you know, manager, multinational owner class in the United States in a way that, you know, I think the part of, you know, a big part of our book is that, you know, that turned out to be good for them, but bad for many Americans as a whole. And so I think it's consistent to say that the policies that were pushed by the U.S. government including most, you know, relevantly for this particular discussion for the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis, you know, ended up hurting the United States as a consequence. So we can say that they're bad for the rest of the world and also bad for most people in the U.S. Brad, I know you've got a hard stop at 12, so I just want to bring you in. And I just fundamentally disagree with John on this. The notion that China built up reserves to protect against financial risk from the U.S., back in the early part of the 2000s, ignores the fact that China didn't, hadn't integrated financially into the global financial system at that time, and it didn't have financial liabilities that it needed to hold reserves against. <laughs> it was the one accumulating assets, but not accumulating assets against inflows or debt. It was building up a net asset position. Taiwan, similar. There is no debt on the other side of Taiwan's balance sheet. All you have is assets. So to, to reduce Asian reserve accumulation to protection from financial globalization risk ignores the fact that China, Taiwan, and many others protect themselves from financial globalization risk with controls. And the accumulation of assets was not to protect against uh, vulnerabilities associated with the liability side of their national balance sheet, large dollar denominated debts and the like, because they didn't have them. At the risk of introducing an, another big concept, which which uh, Brad will tease me about, it does seem to me that there's an absolutely fascinating tension here between an account which runs in terms of inequality and one which poses the question of sovereignty, basically. And 
and and that's that's as it were one of the huge stakes in this argument um, that, that's that's been exposed at this point, and I think is one of the tensions in the positions that people take in in relation to this conversation. I'm, I'm not sure I'm entirely compelled by Brad's comeback in the sense that if you were preparing to subsequently integrate and run up some liabilities, you obviously would do so from a more advantageous position if you started out with a great big reserve, and so. So what you what you, you still might be in the business of not being Indonesia, even if you didn't already have any liabilities on your accounts. But but that is in a sense also a political historian's question: Why did they do it? What do we know about why they did it? You know, that's a I question mean, that we'll have to resolve. Yeah, Daniela, but yeah, but we do know, we do know Brad is right. They didn't do it for uh, prudential reasons. So they did it for mercantilist reasons. It's exchange yeah. rate management to promote exports. Uh, that to me is a very simple story. But, it doesn't but need didn't, financial didn't globalization story. Didn't it work though? Is the question I mean, like it did, uh, it Ma did. Michael was saying before? Well, better thy neighbor works. Well, then if it works, then it is you know nation versus nation. Like the, the contention that these nations, you know, like the the poorer people in these nations would be better off. Even in Germany, I would say, without these mercantilist policies in the context of the international division of labor, I'm not sure it's true. Like I, I, you, you need to look at this through the counterfactual of where those people would be had you know these sort of mercantilist policies and industrial policies not happened and i think that is part of the that is part of the problem and also you know obviously nobody denies you know that that as matt was saying before part of these sort of big surpluses happened not just after the asian crisis but particularly after the 2008 crisis right uh, and they were part of this sort of mercantilist policy um but what sort of you know has created massive political instability and if we look at the us is very small changes in certain key tradable jobs in certain mm -hmm. in, in, in certain big you know industries key industries key companies where like you know the, the distribution between firms is also a very important component of this and the reality here is that the chinese model uh you know and, and if we look at the aerospace sector for example the, which I, I i cover particularly closely um china is now sort of scaling up on their ability to build uh, you know commercial jets uh, the Comac 191 is, is a key part of this, uh, you know, building a, a sort of a domestic engine for it will be the next part of this. Um, all of these, all of these planes, while they're one generation behind from Boeing and Airbus, who were drawn into the country, you know, through, you know, the promise of this market, and now we'll see that seed they planted turned against us, right? Like people in Seattle, people in Chicago mm. who have to, you know, design the development for the the substitute of the 737 MAX, uh, these people might have to contend with a Chinese government that owns the airlines and thus the customers and has taken all this, you know, technological diffusion is now, you know, building a, a, a potential rival. And, and this, to me, you know, even if, even if the amount of jobs lost regionally in the US are not that large, it is much closer to defining the real political tension and the real class war than the net balances that seem to you know, obsess both the savings club school, but also, you know, the, the administration to a point, right? Uh, where they will say, let's have China buy a bunch of agricultural products. Well, that to me doesn't go to the core of what the tension here is. Matt, did you want to- Yeah, I just want to jump briefly. I mean, like the sort of standard story people like economists talk about or, you know, globalists or whatever, like trade, trade displacement shouldn't be a problem because you get new jobs, right? That's sort of the standard story. And I think that that's actually a very reasonable question to ask. Like why, and I think that the, the reason why we talk about, in, you know, the net flows, right? And like the overall, you know, the trade deficits versus just trade induced, you know, losses in manufacturing is because you mechanically cannot have a replacement, that there is some sort of trade off, that if you do get the extra employment and incomes to offset the uh, lost jobs from, you know, trade competition, that the only way to do that is through an increase in debt. And that, tends to lead to financial crises. Now, one of the things we talk about in the book is there are ways, at least if you're in the United States, you can make that relatively less bad in terms of having the federal government you know, be the borrower and so forth and, and sort of employer on that side of things. But there is a trade-off, right? The reason why, you know, we can talk about Boeing specifically, but that's sort of like a micro story. The macro story is, okay, so China is now making planes. That's great for them. Like that means that you're going to have a lot more high-end jobs wages in China. Like those people should be able to buy more stuff. They may not buy it directly from the United States, but they're going to buy it from somebody. So you know, one option is that they export less because they're buying more of their own. They can afford to buy more of what Chinese companies already produce, which is fine. That means there's less stuff you know going to the rest of the world. So the rest of the world is going to produce more, or they'll buy more things that are produced in the rest of the world, and that's going to create jobs and incomes. I mean, that's not 
you know, the macro problem. I mean, there might be some issues in terms of local adjustment, but I think it's it's really important to realize well, that it reduces it, it reduces the market of Boeing and Airbus. Right, but and, like and if you're other, you already have, you have a large diversified economy. I mean, like that can be like we have tools for doing that. There are always changes structurally. I mean, that's not necessarily that is a different order of magnitude problem from what, for example, in the U.S. we actually saw. There was a great paper from the Federal Reserve Bank in New York a couple of years ago. They looked at sort of David Autor's research of what were the places that were particularly hit by you know Chinese imports. Which again, it's important to stress that imports that weren't you know from China that were not matched by corresponding exports because that was a sort of uneven flow. And what they found was that if you look at those places and then you look at the zip codes that also saw the big increases in indebtedness among sort of people on low credit, the sort of the Mian Sufi view, there's an incredible matchup. Like there's <laughs> very, you can very clearly see that their debt substituting for lost jobs. In this case, it was private household debt, which led to a particularly, you know, bad outcome for the US. But I mean, that's, that's the problem, right? If you can uh, come up with a situation to avoid that sort of outcome, then the specific issue of, you know, Boeing versus Comac or whatever is, is relatively less important. So my, my, I'm going that's to... where we fundamentally disagree. Yeah. I think that the progress of nations is based on few key industries pushing the technological frontier and has always been. And if you ignore that fact, even if you have no debt and people are employed in the hospitality business, you will be in a lo lower position in the international division of labor and your potential future gains will be much lower. I think that's a key point here. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think at that point, we've really, our conversation has, has wrapped to a really kind of classic conclusion. And this is one of the great debates of economic policy. It's, a, 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 it's an issue with extraordinary salience for America at this particular moment. Uh, there are also other correlates of the kind of damage that Matthew was talking about in 2016. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. I just want to thank everyone for taking part, for being willing to, to take the risk on having so many people in, in, such, a, in such a format. And um, it's, it's, been, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, thank you all very much for, for taking part, really. It's been, uh, it's been, 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 been great. And um, I, I'd like to thank the Joint Family Institute for hosting us. Um, for Jack for doing the, the legwork of putting this panel together and for, for running the show in the background. And I hope um, the interest that's been generated uh, will spawn further debates on Twitter and another occasion to bring in this group or similar group together again in the not too distant future. Um, thank you all for taking part. Thank you for such a great book, Matthew and, and Michael uh, for provoking this debate. And thank you all for your contributions. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you all very, very much.